Good evening. Welcome to kind of an unusual setting for the, uh, for the IOP. Um, and let me explain why. Each year we host an event to honor the legacies of the late uh, David and Ann Broder, who are two distinguished alums of the university and benefactors of the IOP. As many of you may know, uh, David Broder was the preeminent political journalist of his time, first at the New York Times and for 40 years as the chief political writer and columnist for the Washington Post. He was a brilliant analyst of American politics. As reflected in this paragraph, he wrote about Richard Nixon during the Republican National Convention in 1972, at which Nixon was renominated en route to a landslide reelection victory. He wrote, Richard M. Nixon has achieved something rather remarkable in the last four years. He has managed to shift the program and politics of the Republican Party vast distances in both the foreign and domestic fields while reducing the GOP's liberal and conservative wings to a series of feeble and futile squawks. He has managed this feat by being progressive in his policies and conservative in his politics, which is rather a neat trick even for one as nimble as Mr. Nixon. For commentary like this, he was awarded the Pulitzer Prize in 1973. But beyond his trenchant analysis, what distinguished Dave Broder was the relentless assiduousness with which he reported from the heart of America. He, he didn't cover politics from a perch in Washington or a campaign plane, uh, being spoon-fed by political operatives. Uh, no, he, he famously traveled the country on his own, knocking on doors, stopping in diners and gas stations and bowling alleys and VFW halls, wherever he could find a good conversation with Americans and about their lives and communities and the things that were driving their attitudes about politics. Uh, at one of our previous uh, events, uh, Broder events, two of his celebrated protégés, uh, Dan Baltz and David Marinus, recalled one lunch in the cafeteria at the Post late in Broder's career. It was just a few months after a presidential campaign that had just ended, and uh, Broder turned to them and said, don't you feel like jumping on a plane, going up to New Hampshire and knocking on doors again? <laughs> so, and that was the enthusiasm that characterized uh, his remarkable career. He was endlessly fascinated by the American people and this process of democracy, and it showed in every, every piece that he wrote. I was one of the young political reporters who came of age in Broder's heyday and learned from his example, but I only met his wife, Anne, uh, after he had passed away. And what I learned uh, was that she was a quick-witted, incisive, and indefatigable uh, force in her own right, a good government activist, school board member, and champion of myriad causes in their home of Arlington, Virginia. So we're honored to be associated with the Broders, their passion for democracy, and for good journalism as one of its most fundamental, fundamental cornerstones. And so, of course, we're thrilled to welcome another Pulitzer Prize winner, investigative reporter David Farenthold, now of the New York Times, uh, then of the Washington Post. You kind of went the opposite direction from Broder. Uh, uh, I'm sure, though, that the Broders would have been thrilled uh, that you're here, and we're grateful to you and to my old friend, Marianne Ahern, the longtime uh, Emmy Award winning political reporter for WMAQ television here in Chicago. And we look forward uh, to your conversation. And now, uh, just a few housekeeping notes. After the uh, moderated discussion, we'll open the floor to take questions from the audience. Please line up to ask your question at the microphone. As usual, we'll give priority to the first questions to be asked by our students, as usual, although they always drop this from this text. Uh, I want to remind you that questions begin with a que uh, end with a question mark. And as uh, uh, one more housekeeping note, please put your phones on silent. And now we'll hear uh, formal introductions from Ronan O'Callaghan, a third-year student at the college majoring in history. Ronan, Ronan currently serves as the editor-in-chief of The Gate, the undergraduate political review at the Institute of Politics. So please join me in welcoming Ronan to the platform. Uh, thank you very much, and hello, everyone. Uh, as uh, David said, my name is Ronan, and I'm the editor-in-chief of The Gate at the IOP, and I'm a third-year history student from Boston. And uh, it is my honor to introduce uh, 
David, David Fahrenholt. Uh, David has an illustrious career, having worked as a reporter for the Washington Post and having served as a political an 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 analyst uh, for uh, NBC News and MSNBC. And David is now an investigative reporter for the New York Times, focusing on the world of nonprofits. Uh, some of David's most recognized work uh, pertains to his investigations of President Trump and his family. He won a Pulitzer Prize in 2017 for his investigation into the Trump Foundation's uh, lying about uh, making charitable do donations that they had not. He also broke the story on Trump's remarks uh, made in the infamous uh, Access Hollywood tape. Uh, more recently, he has reported on Trump's legal problems with the uh, New York State judicial system as well. It's a nice discussion will be moderated by uh, Mary Ann uh, Aaron, is that? Ahern. Ahern, thank you. Um, Mary is an Emmy winning reporter who has worked uh, for NBC5 Chicago since 1989. Uh, she became a political reporter for NBC in 2006 and has reported on many important aspects of political life, uh, including breaking the Catholic uh, priest sexual abuse scandal in, in Chicago in 1991. Uh, she has reported on elections within Chicago, uh, Illinois, and around the nation uh, throughout her career. Uh, please, me jo please join me in welcoming David Fahrenholt and Mary Ann uh, Ahern. Ahern, sorry. <laughs> That's Thank all you. right. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. I don't want to miss you guys in the back. Hello, good to see you. So when uh, they all first reached out to me and said, would I be available to come? And the two Davids, I was like, ooh, wow, I know this David. Because I'm a huge follower on Twitter. And if you are any kind of follower on Twitter, you have to be following him. And so I said, whoa, yeah. And then when I heard that he was the honoree for the David Broder uh, event, I said, Double wow, because when I was covering the 2008 presidential campaign and hopping around and trying to keep track of where David was going to be, this David, uh, Axelrod, uh, and of course trying to get the insight on uh, then Senator Obama, um, I saw David Broder at the debates and at the uh, various events, you know, whether it was the conventions, and I w literally was like, whoa. That guy, that's, there's the real deal. There is one smart dude. I read his, work, his, his, his reports every, all the time. I also knew that he had started in Panag the Panagraph in Bloomington, downstate. And my first job was Peoria, Illinois. So how about that? We both got out, thank goodness. Uh, no offense to Peoria, but it was good, it was good to you know, start there and move on. But yeah, so David Broder, whoa. Um, I'm wondering, my first question to you is, who is that for you? Especially, you know, in today's polarized world, and it's so, you know, who do we follow and who's, who's the real deal? Who is your person oh. that when you might have seen over the last few years that you've said, hmm, yeah, I hope people, uh, others read him or her? That's a really good question. I mean, was David Broder at the beginning? I started the, at the Post when David Broder was still there. And he was, he was famous for his office, which was covered up to about the waistline with notes, like with old notebooks, uh, you know, or maybe even above. Uh, but also, he was famous for uh, the, the idea that, as David said, you can't cover politics from Washington. Washington, in some ways, is the worst place to cover politics from. You have to go out and find the voters where they are and, and be surprised by them. Uh, in terms of who, is, who has it been for me, so I just started this job at the Times cover, being an investigative reporter, trying to you know, d d take longer with stories and to dig further into stories than I would have done in the past. Um, so I, the Times has some great investigative reporters, Eric Lipton, Mark Mazzetti, Adam Goldman. That one, part of the appeal was I wanted to sit next to those people. I want to I be there, hear how they do it. Um, because I've, I've spent a lot of time covering politics, and now I'm moving out of politics. And there I learned from a lot of great political reporters. Now I want to be, want to be an investigative reporter, so I want to go where the talent is there and where I can learn the most, uh, right. which has already been amazing. Just you know, the, the Times said this story last week about how the US had been giving intelligence to the Ukrainians to blow up the Russian ship and to blow up Russian generals. To hear them talking about that story before it came out and the ethical questions about what do we reveal, you know, who said what, who's telling us not, not to publish the story. I feel like I've already learned so much just from a couple of days in the office with them. Wow, amazing. With so many students here who might be aspiring, I hope, I hope we haven't killed the journalist, uh, you know, those out there that want to be a journalist. I know you think that journalism matters, but how has your work changed? 
how we all get this story? Because you'd have done it differently. Well, the way I, I felt like covering, I didn't really do it differently for a long time. But then in 2016, I tried to embrace a new way of covering journalism, a new way of covering a story, um, which was sort of, which was to use social media and crowdsourcing. And that was only, like I didn't come up with that I idea one day. It was sort of forced upon me. It was desperation. I was writing about Trump, um, and particularly at that point, his promises to give to charity. Sid had given a lot of money to charity, first in the context of his political campaign. Uh, he, in particular, he said he'd given a million dollars out of his own pocket to a veteran's charity. And I, I came into that as a political reporter, trying to just basically make sure that was true. Um, so I, you know, in a normal political campaign, th 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 so the story that I started out with was Trump, Trump says he gave a million dollars to veterans. Who did he give it to? When did he give it? You know, why did he choose that group? I expected that would be a couple day long story. I, I thought I'd call them, they'd tell me the answer, we'd write about it, we'd learn something about Trump in the process. Um, but of course it was Trump, it wasn't a two day story, they wouldn't tell me. Um, and so I spent all this time trying to prove Trump right, to show that he'd done the thing that he'd already said he'd done. Uh, and, and he wouldn't help me. And then I, I, was, I realized I was in a place where all the things I'd learned as a journalist, all the traditional techniques had, were failing me because like, you know, he gave it to a charity someplace. How the hell am I going to find that you know, out of the millions of charities in America? And so I started asking on Twitter. I started sending out my queries um, to anybody that I thought might have gotten the money. Instead of doing it over email or the phone call, I did it on Twitter because I wanted people to see what I was doing. And I was hoping to run into somebody that I didn't know I was looking for. You know, somebody out, my hope was somebody out there would say, hey, look, I saw you looking for this million dollars Trump gave away. You, know, you didn't ask me, but I got it. I saw you searching, so I'm going to volunteer myself. At the same time thinking, well, maybe Trump will see it, and if he didn't give the money, you know, either he'll, he'll see we're not taking his you know, bluff for an answer, and he'll either fess up where he gave the money or fess up that he didn't give the money. Um, and, and after a couple days of searching for you know, using Twitter as a reporting tool, I'd gotten a lot of attention, but I'd learned nothing. I'd, I was like, this was a waste of time. I'm sorry I did this. Um, uh, but it turned out that tr Trump had seen it. And that night, Trump gave away the million dollars that he'd said he'd given away <laughs> weeks before. But, so I realized the power in two ways, the power of social media to both you help you find people that you didn't know how to find or you didn't even know you were looking for. And in his case, to make the, instead of the stonewalling being the end of the story, now the stonewalling is the story. Now I can show you how I'm being stonewalled and I'm trying to get around it. Um, that doesn't apply to, that doesn't work as well on every beat. It doesn't work well, as well on every story. But if there's times when you can use social media to sort of sh show how hard you're working to get to the truth and also give people a way to find you if they know the truth, um, it can be a really powerful tool. And you went beyond that. I mean, you continued to expose, for instance, how often Trump used his own properties to hold events and how much money, therefore, then he was, the government was paying to his hotels and to his resorts. And was that all done also by social media? That was a real interesting hybrid because, we, so we were interested when Trump was president, obviously wherever the president goes, a whole bunch of people go for, go who were, meals and hotel rooms are paid for by the government. So we knew he was, obviously everybody knew he was going to Mar-a-Lago and to Trump Bedminster and all these other places all the time as president. And Eric Trump had said, well, whenever he does that, you know, we basically give the government the rooms for free, uh, you know, or like the, you know, the 50 bucks a night or something. And so we wanted to check that. And so that started with a very traditional, um, you know, reporting tool. I, I put in a Freedom of Information Act request, a FOIA request to the Secret Service. They were the ones who sort of, you know, sent the most people with Trump. And after a while, we had to sue them at some point, but they did c cough up these records. And so we started to get a sense of, um, you know, how much money every time Trump goes to his own property, how much money he was getting. Um, but there was one element we couldn't get, which was the State Department. So Trump, if you guys may have blocked this out, but if you remember, uh, Trump would have <laughs> meetings with foreign dignitaries, President, you know, the Premier of China, the Prime Minister of Japan, at Mar-a-Lago. And when you do that, even though you're still on American soil, the State Department pays. So they pay both for the foreign dignitaries, they pay for the flower arrangements, they pay for everything. Uh, and a bunch more people will go, like you know, presidential aides and State Department interpreters and things like that, and stay at the, tr at the Trump property and pay Trump. But the State Department wasn't giving us anything. They wouldn't respond to FOIAs, they wouldn't respond to anything, so we sued them. Uh, and it, we went through this long process where we, you know, eventually, th this is now in 2020, we're leading up to the election. After, months after we filed the FOIA request, months after we sued them, 
the State Department said, okay, okay, fine, fine. We're going to give you the records you want, hundreds of pages. We're going to give them to you, like, two weeks before the election, like October 15th or something, 2020. So we said, well, that's not very much time before the election, but it's some time. So we'll get these records, and we can write a story before the election. October 15, 2020 ro rolls around. They sent us two pages. And they're like, oh, sorry. You know, we just we couldn't get around to it. And so and they said, but we'll give you a lot November 15th, you know, two weeks after the election. You can have anything you want November 15th. And that I thought, like, OK, well, I've done everything I can, the normal reporting path. I've even sued them, which not, not everybody has the money to do. And I'm still getting stonewalled. So I'm going to try social media again with low hopes because you know, so I, I said, look, I asked for State Department records showing how much Trump had, uh, you know, the State Department spent at Trump properties, didn't get them, they got stonewalled, they basically they misled us. You know, can anybody help? Does anybody have these records? But like, thinking, well, who the hell has these records? Like, what, what is the universe of people who would have State Department records in hand ready to give out? But I was, again, had no other choice. Put that out there on Twitter. Within a few hours, we had hundreds of pages of records from a source. And so we were able to show that like, Trump charged the government for the glass of water he drank when he was meeting with the prime minister of Japan. He charged for the flowers. You know, We got that whole story because of crowdsourcing. So even in that situation where I thought, OK, the universe of people I'm aiming at is so small, it still worked. How do you make sure that that person is the real, you know, the real deal, that that is an accurate good source. I, I, I'm thinking, wow, this sounds like Watergate when they met under the garage somewhere. <laughs> totally. You know, like, is this all done by email? I mean, I, you, you got to be able to trust who's giving you this. Well, it's even harder in a pandemic because you, 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 you'd have to be at opposite ends of the garage. Uh, but <laughs> but in, in that situation, yes, you're always wary that when people reach out to you over, so when, when people do reach out over social media and say, hey, you asked for this, you know, here, I have the documents, you have to treat it like, you know, the, you know, there's no special trust you put in that because it came in over Twitter. You have to treat it like any other source, which is you have to find ways of verifying it. You have to understand who the person was. You have to understand, okay, did, would this be a person that would really have access to this information? Can I trust it? Does it match things we already know? For instance, like, does it match the room rates that we know Trump charges at Mar-a-Lago, $650 a night, um, for, for each room? Like, does it match other things we know? And in that case, it did, and we knew the source and knew this was a person who would have access to these records. And does that that take a day, a week? How long is all that? It depends. Sometimes it takes a long time. Sometimes you get stuff you can never use because you can never be totally sure it was legitimate. Uh, in that case, the source was good enough that we knew pretty much right away what it was. But then it just took a long time to go through all the information, make sense of it, and write the story. Uh, just as, as an aside, like there have been times when people have tried to hoax us. I mean, one good example from 2016, another reporter uh, called me and said, look, we just got a call from somebody who said, um, you know, that the, the, they were Trump's secretary back in the day, and the Trump said all these horrible anti-Semitic things, and they want to meet us at the Starbucks, and they'll tell us. And he's like, you know, I'm going to go over there and meet them. My, my co-reporter, you know, my, my fellow reporter had talked to this person. He's like, I'm going to go over there and meet them, but, you know, to me, just be on standby in case this is something you, we want to cover. Be ready to jump in if this is legit. So he goes, and this is, this is good advice for any journalist in the audience. He got there 10 minutes early which is a good idea in this case, because he's sitting there at the Starbucks waiting around, and somebody taps him on the shoulder and said, listen, I need you to leave this seat. I need you to move from this seat. And he's like, why? He's like, the Washington Post is coming in 10 minutes, and we're going to trick them. And I need you, and I need <laughs> my friend who has a camera needs to sit at this seat so they can get it. And so, uh, so Ben, the other reporter, left after that and called me. He's like, what should I do? He's like, should I go back there and confront them? I was like, if you go back and confront them, you'll be on video. But do he did it anyway. Yeah. So you certainly that the hoaxes do come over the transom. In my experience, much, it's, the, the problem was much more likely to be that people didn't have what they thought they, have, they, thought they had or didn't have exactly what I needed. I, if I found very few cases where it seemed like people were doing it to be malicious. OK. You also were the first that had the video of Trump talking about groping women. I don't want to say the exact words, because it's pretty awful. But you know, some thought that was going to really change the, the whole turn of events of him getting elected. It didn't change it, but it still is in a lot of people's minds, and certainly I remembered it. Uh, how did you get that? That I can't tell you. Uh, there's, there, <laughs> it's a great story, but I can't tell you. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I, you know, I thought it was, I, I, I don't know. At, at that point, you know, the, I had sort of changed the, the obviously if that videotape had come out about Mitt Romney in 2012, it would have ended his career. But Trump obviously had conditioned people to, to accept lots of bad things about him, and people cared, people liked him anyway. 
Um, so I didn't, you know, the, the expectation when that story came in was not like, oh, Donald Trump is done. It was not when we did it, obviously, to like, and it was not the expectation that we'd taken Donald Trump out. Um, you know, it, it, if, it had, if the timing of that and the James Comey letter had been reversed, you know, it, it, the, the election might have turned out differently, but I didn't go into it thinking that I had just sealed the election and that was not the point of it. All right, so President Trump, fake news, something we hadn't really heard of before, that constant complaint. Do you think there's a shift today with the Biden administration? Are they more accessible? Accessible. Uh, I don't deal with them that much, so I, I feel like I'm not a great barometer of that. Um, I do feel like they are they sort of regard the press in the way that every other, in, in broadly in the way that every other journalist, every other administration before Trump did, which is like, you know, they, they want to be covered by us. They want us to cover them accurately. If they're Democrats. They feel like we don't, we, we're, we're not nice enough to them. Republicans feel the same way. Yeah. But they are, I think, normal in that way. Um, I don't know if they're great or, or, or terrible, but they're not Trump. I mean, Trump was really an anomaly that they have gone back from that. All right. Interesting to hear. Um, now you're at the New York Times. Wow. And uh, tell us, I want to know a little more about a couple of the stories. You say you have more time, but my goodness, you've already... I've already <laughs> written three stories in three months. It's incredible. I know. I'm like, you're not taking that. Well, I'm going to have six months to work on this kind of routine. It, you know, the, the investigative guys, even in TV news, were all like, what are they doing today? I'm doing two stories. What are yeah, they right. doing? They're thinking big thoughts. You know, like, <laughs> wait a minute. Uh, for one of the stories you did, uh, Crime Stoppers in Houston. Okay, so Crime Stoppers. I have literally hosted. I've been the MC before at the Crime yeah. Stoppers mm -hmm. dinner. You know, trying to be out there helping out some kind of nonpartisan, supposedly nonpolitical group. But little did I know, in Houston, uh, they were condemning more than a dozen elected judges, all of them Democrats, mm -hmm. and their budget relied on same judges. That was a, so I, I grew up in Houston. Crime Stoppers is, is a bigger deal there than it is anywhere else. Like Crime Stoppers is the end of every news, every TV news segment. TV news used to stage reenactments for them. Like they would like reenact crimes for people to see, for, to draw attention to Crime Stoppers. They have their own building. They have millions of dollars. But this is I cover. I, I wanted to switch to this nonprofit beat, and this is why. This is exactly, this is exactly why because. You, you automatically trust, people automatically trust what nonprofits do without understanding the, that nonprofits are made up of humans and nonprofits have financial motivations. And in this case, what it turned out had happened was Crime Stoppers made a classic mistake in, in the world, nonprofit world, which is they had a ton of money and they decided they wanted a building. So they have a staff of 12. They bought an entire city block, tore a building down, and built a three-story headquarters for their staff of 12, spending $12 million. Uh, which they did not have, which they expected they could raise, but then couldn't. So they went from surpluses and uh, you know uh, black in the black to in the red, needing a loan. And so in that moment, they did two things. One, they turned to Greg Abbott, the governor of Texas, a Republican. He gave them a four million dollar grant, um, which saved their bacon, kept them. You know that was a huge amount of the money they needed for that year. Uh, and they listed him as anonymous in their in their list of donors. This, he did it with public money, but he was anonymous. Um, after that, they began supporting Greg Abbott, praising him. They'd never been they'd never been partisan before in any way. They start praising Greg Abbott, talking about what a great guy he is. At the same time, they depend on judges. So Texas does Illinois elect judges? Yes. The terrible system. No one should ever do it. Uh, but, te but Texas does also. Um, and the Crime Stoppers' source of income, one of its biggest source of income, was the judges could make probationers, as a condition of their probation, pay Crime Stoppers 50 bucks. Even if Crime Stoppers didn't catch you, whatever. You have to make $50 to, to Crime Stoppers to get out of jail. So th they lived for a while on this stream of income that they had to do no work to get. The judges would make involuntary donors give them this money. So 2018, uh, the Beto wave in Texas, obviously Beto doesn't get elected, but he, it, in Harris County, Houston, changes everything. They, they, they wipe out all the Republican judges. Suddenly there's all these Democratic judges, many of them very liberal. And so many of them stop making, the, the probationers pay the $50 fee to Crime Stoppers. Crime Stoppers loses. At the same time, it's, it's put itself in this financial hole. They lose this reliable source of involuntary donations. And so their solution was to go on television and attack individual judges by name. You know, C Judge Chris Morton of the 185th District Court is letting criminals out to kill again uh, without ever telling people, you know, we have a financial incentive in this guy losing. If he loses, we make more money. Uh, and uh, understanding that, like, that financial relationship to their rhetoric makes you understand, you understand much more 
where they're coming from or maybe why they've chosen this path. Which, as a Houstonian, as somebody who loved that institution, covered it, you know, thought it was the most trusted institution in the world, it was a fascinating, uh, fascinating look inside. And, and has local media hopped on it, too? And what's, now what's going on? So they, their um, local television media there is very close to Crime Stopper. So some of them have jumped in to attack us. Some of them have, have, have asked questions. Um, it's been really interesting to see the fallout from it. Uh, I, don't, I don't know how it's affected Crime Stoppers. Certainly they have not repented of their, of their uh, secret partisanship. They seem, to have, uh, they seem to have continued on in being a very, a very political organization. Um, but yeah, it was, that's a case where I, I didn't write that story thinking that they would change or they right. had to change. But if you're someone in Houston who sees this group and sees it with, through the eyes of 40 years of trust and 40 years of solving crimes, you're missing something. And I wanted to tell you what that was. And was that the motivation for, or did someone reach out to you and say, you gotta, you gotta come back here. You know, you're Yo, from totally. here, and you, yeah. you know this is not true. That's what happened. I, I, the first day at the Times, I tweeted out like, "Hey, I'm looking for, you know, stories about nonprofits, places where people are using nonprofits to hide fraud, you know, power plays, partisanship, whatever." And I got like 700 responses from people all over the country. Some of them were like, "You should investigate my brother-in-law. He runs a foundation." <laughs> but, uh, but a lot of them were about um, really fascinating groups that have huge. You know, I'm still obviously like working my way through some of the really good tips that came out of that. But this was one of them. And I teamed up with a reporter from the Marshall Project, Carrie Blakinger, who knew Houston really well. Uh, so that was a real luxury to get to go, go back to my hometown with somebody who actually knew it. Wow, that I, I still can't get over how you have used social media to your. Do you think anyone else in, in the country does it as does it as much as you do and have had such a success? I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think, I, I, I don't know. It's a good question. I don't want to say nobody does it as well as I do, because I'm sure there are people who do it better. Um, it's just the thing that I've found is that it's, it's, you have to be sure you're using it in the right way. Yeah. Um, and, and that means, like, I don't put all my reporting out on Twitter. I don't tell you what I'm searching for if I don't, you know, I'm not, I don't want to be in a position of like asking a question on Twitter where it turns out I've like cast aspersions on somebody who's innocent, right? Okay. You know, okay. there are times Good when you, you can show people the steps that you're taking in your reporting, um, but that's only a certain kind of story. Like the Trump story was ideal for that because he'd already made a claim. And I'm just saying like, here I am trying to prove this claim is true. Um, but the, the using it as a, as a way to get in ideas Especially on a beat like this, where like there's so many millions of nonprofits, you could spend you know a whole year just learn, sort of learning that world. To have pe to have a way to put it out there that I'm interested in these stories and have the stuff come in, it's such a luxury. It makes me look so much smarter than I am that I have all these people sort of doing my legwork for me. Yeah, it's like having you know the the globe is your newsroom kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, and you don't realize. I mean, one of the things that, that I learned in this process is that the readers know so much more than I do about any topic, even a topic like Trump that I consider myself an expert on. Readers know so much more than I do. And then often you find things you aren't even looking for. I mean, just as one, one example from the Trump beat, when I was writing about Trump's charity, his non, his, the Trump Foundation, one of the mysteries that I was trying to solve back in 2016 was the smallest donation in the history of the Trump Foundation. He gave a $7 gift to the, or grant, $7 grant to the Boy Scouts in like 1989. So, <laughs> You know, you see that on the list of donations, seven dollars to the Boy Scouts from a billionaire. There's got to be a story there, right? But I had thought, well, there's no way in hell I'm ever going to find out what that story is. You know, it's 1989, so long ago. The Boy Scouts won't talk to me. Trump won't talk to me. Like, I don't even really know where to start looking to find what this was. Um, and so I, I put it on Twitter, just as like, not like, hey, I need your help, but more like, oh, this, there must be a good story here, but I'm, I'm never going to be able to find it. It's lost in the midst of history. Just like, let's all enjoy this mystery together. And somebody out there started doing something that I had not thought of, which was he started going back and looking at digitized ads from newspapers in New York in 1989. And he found one that said, and it was amazing to watch this happen. Like, I'm in a cab or something watching all this happening. People were like doing all this work that I had never thought to do. And they were like, well, maybe it was the popcorn. If you ever, if some of you were Boy Scouts way back when, they used to make us sell popcorn. It was the world's worst popcorn. It popped <laughs> several years earlier. It held, held no candle. People bought it out of guilt, basically. Was it the popcorn? But no, the popcorn, you know, like they tweeted like at Trails End Popcorn, I think it's called. How much did popcorn cost in 1989? No, oh, that was like $5. It doesn't fit. So then somebody found a digitized ad that says, you know, enroll your son. This is like the fall of 1989. Enroll your son in the Boy Scouts today in New York. Registration is only $7. Oh. And it was the year Donald Jr. turned 11 or whatever year you can join the Boy Scouts. So 
Donald Trump used the charity's money to pay his son's $7 entrance fee to the Boy Scouts. <laughs> like that, that tells you so much more about him than you know, almost anything. And that would only have been found if I, you know, I only found that because I asked for help that way. Wow, and you've done even some more work on the status of his businesses today. What's going on? Well, the, we, when, he became, when he was elected president, the Trump Foundation basically went away. It eventually closed down after a lawsuit from the New York Attorney General. So then we started covering his businesses. And that meant trying to find new sources. People, you know, the idea was Trump had always made it so the only person who could tell you about his businesses was him. It's, they're, they're not public companies. They put out very little. Like they have a press, they have a spokesperson, but she never speaks. You know, there's no, there's not really like a like an independent set of facts out there about the Trump Organization that you can turn to. It was just him, and so he could say whatever he wanted about his business. And usually, there was nobody there to fact check him. And so we wanted to try to find, like, let's try to look inside the black box. And usually that meant finding people who had, like, they couldn't see the whole picture. I mean, it would have loved to have somebody who could see the whole picture. But I'm looking for somebody who can see just a little bit of, like, their piece of what's inside there. But that gives me a view in that I wouldn't have otherwise before. So that meant, like, golf club members, uh, investors in Trump's hotels, uh, you know, gov local governments that handled Trump properties and might have some sort of records of their interactions with him. We spent so much time compiling hundreds and hundreds, thousands and thousands of names that we, that uh, people who might have some sort of knowledge, and then just mass emailing all of them or calling all of them to try to find. And the, re the response rate was like one in a hundred. You know, Trump's hotel in Chicago, the individual hotel rooms are sold off. Like, so you might stay in room 1845. And it looks like every other room to you, but it's actually owned by you know, Joe Smith and Cicero. Like, we, we're trying to find Joe Smith, because he gets a little bit of information about how his room is doing and how the whole hotel is doing. And so we emailed like hundreds of people, and like five of them wrote back. Um, but those five knew a lot, and they knew something that we could only get from them. So like building that kind of set of sources one little bit at a time. You know, I can see a little bit about this property and a little bit about that property. Can I compare them? That was an extremely tedious process, but there was no, you know, it was, it was a case where because that company is so closed off, um, any little bit of actual verifiable fact is something to celebrate. Um, so we spent a long time building that up, and then of course he got into social media, and so like, uh, you know, my knowledge about golf courses became less important. Um, but yes, that was, that was, while he was president, we wanted to know, was he using the presidency to benefit his business? Or the other way around, where his business is hurting in a way that would affect his use of power you know, would he, was he, you know, because he, he saw two halves of the world and the public only saw half of that. You know, he saw that we saw the public half, but he also saw that and what was happening with his business. And so if we don't understand this half of it, we can't understand really what, how he sees the world. That was the idea, which we did with varying degrees of success. The New York Times actually uh, got his tax returns. And so the, the, the Times actually got a lot of, by looking further into the past, got a lot of stuff that we didn't get. And haven't you reported recently that the status today is that he's gone back to some of those donors to help prop him up? Yeah, and he also went, you know, the, the, he's in this, he has this new social media company, and a lot of it, he's like gone back to, so yeah, since he's gotten out of office, he's gone back to lenders uh, that like helped him, you know, refinance his loan on Trump, uh, Trump Tower in New York. Um, he's used his own campaign to support his businesses. The Saudis are supporting his businesses by holding a big golf tournament at Trump Bedminster and Trump Doral. Um, and he's got a lot of his friends investing in this new Truth Social, uh, his new social media app. So yes, like the political campaign connections he made are now sustaining him in the in in, in his business. I mean, even keep talking to people who belong to Trump Bedminster. I mean, it's like the um, it, you know there's MAGA hats around the pool now where there didn't used to be. So you know the politics have sustained the business and replaced the people that he drove out with his politics. And today, Elon Musk says that Trump will be reinstated to Twitter. Uh, should he, you know should Elon Musk all of this go through? What do you think about that? <laughs> I thought about that, so I, 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 I have a Tesla, and we discovered the other day, I was sitting with my daughter in the car, we were waiting for my other daughter to come out of a party. So my Tesla, it's a great car. Uh, it also, we discovered by like messing around on the touch screen, it will make farting noises. You, I can make it fart loudly. Like it, it, like it produces internal and external fart noises. So someone at Tesla spent time coding and engineering like a fart machine. And I think of that, like that to me is a great metaphor for Elon Musk. Like he's in some ways like a, a visionary business leader, but also like an 11 year old with, you know, and I don't know which half of them will run Twitter, but it seems like the 11 year old is, you know, 
So I don't, know what, I don't know what Twitter's gonna be like then. I already feel like I am using Twitter much less than I was, um, just because I feel like it's, it gives you a warped view of the world. It gives you a warped view of who your audience is. It's, you know, the people that I interact with on Twitter are great in a lot of ways, but I can't use them as a proxy for the audience for my stories because they're much more political, much more informed, they're much more tied to New York and Washington. So I've already tried to use it a lot, use it when I need it, but not to use it all the time, not to have it be the way that I see the world. And I imagine if he gets back, if Elon Musk gets control of Twitter and sort of opens the, you know, undoes all the things that they had done to make it a more, a more less abusive, less, um, you know, but, but less full of disinformation, I imagine I'll use it less. And, and there are those who are concerned that if Trump is back on Twitter, that he will increase the likelihood of political violence. Is that going too far? Well, I mean, Twitter obviously is not Trump's only tool. You know, he, he has a lot of other tools. He, may, he has his own theoretical uh, social network he could use. Obviously, we can look at the past and see that what Trump did after the 2020 election led to violence, led to people, you know, both on Twitter and other forms, it led to people storming the Capitol. Um, so I do worry about that, but I, I, I don't think that, you know, Twitter is the only way Trump could get that message out or is getting that message out. All right. All right. Let's go also to what you've been working on most recently. Uh, this past weekend, uh, the United Nations, <laughs> a top UN official was forced to resign <laughs> within like what uh, hours of yeah, your, of three your or four story hours, yeah. of, of your story being posted explain what happened it's the UN office for project services so th this was such a this is such a fun story about the UN so a place the UN to me is like Congress like I it has there's great stories there but I wouldn't want to cover it every day I did cover Congress every day and, and it you know the, covering its actual business is terrible covering its scandals is amazing uh, so the, the UN uh, in this case the there's a UN agency a very obscure UN agency that found itself with a lot of extra money. They, they, their job normally was to, they were sort of like a general contractor for the UN. So if you needed them to, you needed to build a road, you needed to build a school, uh, you needed to you know, clean up a minefield, they were good at that. Um, but there was no prestige in that in the UN. In the UN, the prestige comes from standing at a podium, giving out money, you know, and they were sort of like downstream from that. And so the leaders of this group ended up with a bunch of money. They, they made money by charging other UN agencies to, to do their work for them. And they charged way too much and stockpiled like $100 million. And they, they said, OK, well, now we're going to stand at the podium. We're going to give out the money. We're going to be a bank. We're going to start loaning money out. We're going to do something the UN has never done, um, which sounded like a great idea in theory. But then they met a guy at a party, and they gave all the money to him. Uh, <laughs> they, they, Crazy. <laughs> they met a guy at a party, and they gave they loaned his company fifty eight million dollars, uh, and they gave his daughter on top of that they gave his like twenty three year old daughter three million dollars to produce a pop song about the ocean. Uh, so it was like it was just a, like a the quintessential like how do how do you spend money when it's not your money right? So these people they had a big pile of money that they could do anything they wanted to with, and they confidently gave it to this guy. And now, of the $58 million they gave him, at least $22 million is gone. Apparently, some of it he used to pay off other debts that he had to other people. So he took the UN's loan and used it to pay loans he already had to other people. Uh, and so just unraveling that and like trying to get, it was sort of like covering, you know, there was, there was some elements that were familiar to me from covering the government, the US government, and that people were like, oh, it's bad, but nothing can be done about it, right? This is just how things are. It, um, and it, it took a while to sort of unravel it enough that you could tell the story in a way that a regular person could understand and you could break through sort of the UN jargon. Um, we were lucky that there were some great characters in here. One of the great characters was, uh, this sort of brought me back to my Trump roots, uh, the guy who introduced the UN to the guy who now has their money was the same person who introduced Donald Trump to Melania Trump back in the day. Um, <laughs> An Italian, the chances of that. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> an Italian man about town. Uh, it was a, one of the, I was telling the students earlier that one, one of the most amazing reporting experiences we ever had was we're trying to establish that they met this guy at a party. Like that, that, that was like a key detail that they met this person at a party. But we couldn't figure out what party or when. So it, we're finally, we think we know the party. But we, we're, we're like, okay, well, how do you prove two people met at a party in 2015? And if you can, how do you prove that was the first time they met? So I was a little dubious we would ever be able to do that. And then we got a photo of them at this party. Thankfully, the UN has lots of like party photographers. Um, we got a photo of them at the party in which um, the UN official was holding his business card uh, and like facing it toward the camera so you can see. So like that, that like 
I was like, okay, well, that's how you know. That's a photo that actually shows people are meeting for the first time. Wow. Um, yeah, so a few hours, they, they, the UN basically, uh, a few hours after our story ran, the head of that agency who had been sort of holding out was forced to resign. Um, so there could be more uh, there. We don't know yet if it was corruption or just like massive incompetence. Um, but it was it was an amazing story to learn. Like wow, this is uh, this tells you so much about the way the UN works in a in the in the context of a story that's fun to read. Well, and I even read in the comments in your Twitter feed today of of this story, which I thought was interesting. Someone said people have gone to jail for a lot less. Might that happen? It certainly might. Uh, the UN is a place that is one of the reasons this happens is the UN is basically outside of normal accountability. So there's no police, there's no prosecutors. There's been an investigation into what happened, but the investigation is over, and they just haven't told us what's going on. Uh, they don't have to tell you the result of the investigation. So it could be that the people who ran this UN office could be referred for prosecution, but the UN Secretary General would have to sort of strip them of their immunity for that to happen first. So it could happen, but it hasn't happened yet. All right, so where do you think we all stand in the, in the future of journalism? Uh, you know, there are just so many sources, so many places you can go today. And I, I fear that some don't know the difference between Facebook and the New York Times. I know the people in here know that. But <laughs> a lot of people out there do not know the difference. Yeah. How do we convey that? And how do we also convey to students that the good old fashioned legwork still, maybe it's done on Twitter today, but it still is what, what it takes to get a good story. Well, I, I obviously worry, like all of us do, about people who turn to Facebook or Twitter and you know, read something that they, that they want to be true and, and then treat that as the news rather than, than you know, reading it you know, in a place like the Washington Post or the New York Times that works hard to make sure that we're telling you the truth. So obviously I don't run Facebook, and so there's, like, I can't control what they do. But I try to think, like, what can I do that makes, you know, will help if, if people happen upon my story? That part, you know, if they happen on it, I can't control that much. But if they do, what can I do with my story or my tweets to make you understand the value of what I've done? And so a couple ways. One is on Twitter, on social media. I try to do as much as I can to show you how hard I work to get this story. You know, how, how much, you know, these are all the steps I took to get this. This is, this is all the work that went into it. If possible, to show you while I'm doing it. You know, so you can have more trust in this. Like, oh, that's the guy. You know, back in 2016, I posted a lot of photos of my notebook as I went down this list trying to tr track down Trump's donations because it looks like work. You know, you look at it and you go, okay, that guy's working. He's trying to find 100%. the answer. Here. That's how I, I yeah. you did a lot on the Trump Hotel here in Chicago. Yeah, I did. I was like, who is this guy? Yeah. <laughs> I need to follow him. Right, otherwise, like, if you're a reader, you know, and you're interested in my topic, like, my stories appear at what seem to be random intervals. You don't know when I'm going to write one. You don't, and then they could be long, they could be short. You don't know how to, even if you're interested, how do I give you a place where you know you can watch this space and, and you'll, you'll be caught up? So social media is valuable for that. I, I can show you the reporting I'm doing. I can tell you the reporting I did after it's over. Um, the other thing is about the stories themselves. And I'm really conscious of the fact that you know, we used to believe, back in the old, old days when we were just writing for print, there was so much focus on what we called the kicker, which was the last line in a story. We'd put so much effort into, like, am I going to write a great little last line? And then the internet came along, and we could see that nobody read the last line. They, read, <laughs> they all had stopped reading long before they got to this thing that I'd put so much effort into. Um, and so how, could, how should that change the way we, well, which is probably the case always. Like, people were never reading that line, but we didn't know. So how, do, how does that change the way that we write stories? Well, I think, one, the stories have to be longer, maybe shorter, uh, but also, like, we have to think about, am I creating off-ramps in my story because I'm trying to do an artful turn of phrase or because I, I think this little aside is interesting? Am I giving you a, a paragraph? You know, we, we've all done this. I've done this, obviously, as a reader of a story. As you go down the story where you go, okay, I'm done. You know, and, and if I give you that off-ramp in the fifth paragraph, it doesn't matter what's in the tenth paragraph, you're gone. So is there a way to write stories in a way that's simpler, it's easier to understand, that's maybe not as artful or as sort of artistic, but that keeps your attention, keeps you moving? Um, if, if there's, for reporter, people who want to be reporters, there's a book I really recommend called Writing Tools by Roy Peter Clark, who talks about this. Like, put something interesting in every paragraph. Give me something like a capital letter, interesting detail in every paragraph. He calls them gold coins, because otherwise people are leaving. The Post has had an editor uh, who was the opposite approach of that. Uh, every he wanted every paragraph to be about 100 words long and in a giant square. There'd be no capital letters in it. Your eye couldn't even read it. Like, I wrote the story, and I can't read the thing that he put in there. Uh, you have to think about 
can you keep people's attention? And are you giving them ways to leave your story? And if so, you know, how, how can you change that? I think that has to change the way we write because you don't want people to, to leave the story that you worked so hard on before they get to the stuff you found. And how much do you see today journalism of the intersection of broadcast and print and the internet? How much you really cannot just be this investigative reporter who is writing your solo article because if you're not conveying it as you do so well here today, who's going to be interested? Who's going to know who you are? All of that. I mean, there's just so much more of an intersection. Oh, totally. I mean, I love being on television because it's a way, it's a whole new set of people that didn't, you know, you can point to your story. I, like I used to tell the Post people um, when I was writing about Trump, I want to be on the radio. You put me on the radio wherever. You know, I want to be on radio stations. You know, not obviously New York, you know, the big cities, but I, you put me on the radio in Des Moines, Baton Rouge, wherever, because I want people to, that don't read the Washington Post every day to, to hear about this and have a reason to go check it out. And also because I, I think it's helpful in those things too to hear the questions people have. If you go on call-in radio shows, the questions that, re, that listeners have are often things that you think are obvious or you would never think to ask. It just lets you see what a real reader thinks and wants to know. Um, but I, that's, I think that's great to like try to find as many new audiences as I can everywhere. The danger, I think, is the pressure to be pundits. Um, there, there were times on television when I was like asked to, to opine about, you know, the health care bill or repeal of Obamacare or whatever, and I would say like I don't know anything about that. And they would be like, "That's fine, you know, like come on anyway." Um, and I think that's really dangerous, both because it's boring, but also because I, th I think there is a real sense among some people in D.C. that the highest form of journalism is punditry. Basically, you're a journalist, so you can g figure out how Washington works, and then you can become a pundit, and you can predict things. That's the, ne that's the highest level is to go on television and say, well, the next thing that's going to happen is this. That's so, I mean, it was probably never that useful, but now it would, we've seen, like, so much has changed. And the idea that because you covered something that happened in 2008, that it's going to happen the same way now, you can't rely on that at all. And in fact, your belief that you know how Washington works may blind you to the fact that it's working differently. So I think that's the one thing that I would like to change about television is the sort of, and, and, and print journalism too, the idea that like what we're, what we're really out there to do is to predict what's going to happen next when I feel like that is such a fool's errand. It always was, but especially now. Right. Okay, tell us, you're, you've been to both of the major papers, the, the Post and the New York Times. How are they different? How are they alike? What, you know, obviously you like where you are, but I mean, is there something you might miss from the Post? What, what is that like? So as a, as a funny aside, one thing that I've noticed that's different about the Times is the uh, focus on contractions. Or the lack, the, or the, 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 I wrote my story once and I got like an angry, or, you know, a scolding call from my editor who was like, there, there's a place in the New York Times for hadn't and can't, but not in this story. It's too serious. It's got to be had not and cannot. Oh, my uh, so, oh that's interesting. Uh, that's the one difference is the, is the contractions. Um, ah. But uh, they're actually a lot alike. The, the, the Times is a bigger institution and has more, basically the, I, the Times is like the Post was when I was, when I first started in 2000. The Post was a, it was a big place, it had always been big, there were like, you know, lots of in-house experts and a sense that like whatever you were doing, someone had already done it before and there was a manual for how you should do it, you know. And then the Post had a lot of really lean years where the, we got small and we lost a lot of people because we were really dependent on a local print-based advertising model that didn't work. Um, and so then a lot of that in-house expertise was lost. And the Post then, after Jeff Bezos bought the Post in 2013, has been rebuilding that um, from, a, from a much lower base and discovering ambitions beyond what we used to be. The time, so the Post was, there was much more a sense that you were like reinventing the wheel as it went along, which was great. Like the thing that I did, you know, using social media to report in 2016, I didn't have to ask anybody at the Post. I just started doing it. And then they were happy, with, you know, they, but there was no person I needed to check with. It was much more freewheeling. The Times, it feels like it is, it's a big institution where people, there's a structure that people understand. There's lots of in-house experts. There might be less room to experiment. I don't know yet, but it, it feels much more like the Post did when I got there. In the, for this story about the, the UN, like we needed to know how much it costs to write a song. So this charity got paid $3 million to produce a song. Like, is that a lot or a little? I don't know. So the Times is a business and music reporter. And I, I found him, I called him up and he was like, oh, well, you know, I know all about how much songs cost. Like, I'll give you people to talk to. Like, to have that kind of expertise in-house wow. is really cool. That uh, is, that's amazing. Yeah, really okay, fun. so five years ago, you won the Pulitzer. This is the week they announced them. Obviously, yesterday, the Tribune, uh, many other places, you know, people are very thrilled about their awards. How has that 
you know, when people say your name, Pulitzer Prize, like right out, you know, it's sort of, ha, is that an awesome responsibility? I mean, or is it just, you know, it, obviously it's changed your career, I would think. Yo, oh, definitely. I mean, that it does change your career. I mean, it, it gives people, a, like it, it gives you this sense, it gives, gives you sort of a, a shorthand that people outside the world of journalism know, you know, know that you've done something that they're interested in, you know, know they've done something, you've done something that they, they've heard of. Um, I don't know. I, for me, I think covering Trump and Access Hollywood was probably a bigger deal. Like that was such a huge news story at the time that it probably like that gave me more of a platform. Um, How many more Twitter followers then? Oh, I mean, I started out the, the Trump coverage with like seven thousand, and I have like eight hundred and forty-five thousand now. Um, so, but like that, that I think changed my life more than the Pulitzer. Um, uh, one funny story. But the day of the Pulitzers were announced, my daughter, who's now 10, was, uh, so she, she was five then. She was standing next to me in the newsroom. She had this beautiful blue sequin dress on. And, the, and like when, when they announced that you've won, everybody started clapping, and it kind of scared her. So she, like, I was holding on to her in the picture. Um, and she was holding a little reporter's notebook. And that was on the front page of the Post. Um, and it was such an like, inspiration, because Alexandra saw, saw that. She knew that she was a celebrity. Obviously, everybody had seen her picture, but she was determined to wear it as lightly as possible to be as cool as she could. Like <laughs> people knew what she knew. She walked down the street, people knew her, but she wasn't going to make a big deal out of it. Once we were in a, we went to North Carolina to go to a, watch a basketball game, and we were like in Raleigh, North Carolina, and she looked at me. Like, this is like a year later, and she was like, "Daddy, the people here probably don't know me because they don't read the Washington Post." <laughs> 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 so, uh, I don't know, I've tried to be, if, if I got any celebrity out of that, I tried to be as, like, uh, to wear it as lightly as Alexandra did. Well, in researching for today, I did watch that video of uh, when they gave you the award there in the newsroom, and I always think that is the coolest thing, how everybody gathers around, and Marty Barron, who had been in Chicago, was there, yeah. and he referred to your mother, and, you know, as a mom of three, I just thought, oh, gosh, I love how moms still get some, yeah. you know, like, credit <laughs> that they've it, been waiting for, yeah. It's a little like your wedding or something, that, and that, like, you get to gather everybody that you've ever known together, and you can thank people. It was, like, a really funny occasion. Yeah. Yeah. My mother, so I, I have two kids, and my, my older daughter was with me. My, old, my younger daughter was only one and a half at the time, so my mother was holding her. And Stella, the little one, got hungry during the, the process, and my mother was feeding her a banana. And one of the pictures, that this like beautiful picture of us all in the newsroom, you can see my mother holding a banana in the background. You can't see the baby. It just looks like a woman <laughs> in the background holding up a banana. So we have that frame someplace. Oh, gosh, that's great. Well, I think it's a good time, perhaps, to transition into questions from everybody that's here. If you all have some, you know, the mics. Mike is over here on this side. If you don't mind walking over to the mic, or she'll come to you if you raise your hand so that we can get some of you also engaged. There has to be some questions. Oh, over here, go ahead. Hi, uh, my name is Ewan. I'm a third year in the college. So my question is actually for both of you, Marianne, if you also like to answer. So I think we heard a lot of fascinating like stories of how we do investigative journalism. I think a lot of that depends on resources. Um, the outlets like New York Times and Washington Post provides, the networks like your social media followers, obviously. I'm wondering what does that mean for local journalism? And are we seeing a future of journalism where local news is gonna become more dominated by those you know, like national news outlets and we're seeing less independent newsrooms? Well, I could start with, you know, I think we, we have all gone, you know, we're an industry like any other. They, there's peaks and valleys, of course. You know, there's cuts, and then they come back and say, guess what? We had a big investigative unit, now we have a smaller one. But I, I do see a commitment, I've been there a long time, but I do see a commitment to politics. Um, there's certain beats in Chicago that are just sort of, you know, uh, there, there's no way, sports and politics, you know, I mean, that people care about. They want to know what's going on. Um, and so I feel, while I might not have a bunch of researchers to help me, recently um, the photographer editor that I work with that is, you know, my, he's sort of my lifeline. Um, the previous one left, and I went to the news director and said, oh, my God, you know, th we're, this is key. During the pandemic, we used to work with whoever. But during the pandemic, we worked with one person so that if one of us got sick, we didn't infect the whole newsroom. So he said, well, I got a, I got a surprise for you. Mike McGovern wants to work with you. I nearly cried. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a guy that's gone to the Olympics. This is a guy who today, now after doing this for two years with me, says every single day, as I left tonight, what do we have for tomorrow? 
<laughs> What's on for? I mean, that's like craziness, honestly. A lot of people could care less. You know, they've done it a hundred times. You know, whatever. Who cares who's in town? The president's in town tomorrow, actually. Biden's in town. And, you know, Mike wants to know, where are we going to be? What do I need? Well, that kind of stuff. So I, I don't have the resources to call up the music business person, you know, <laughs> to call him and ask a question to. But I do have the ear and the back of, the, of people in the newsroom that when I do raise my hand and say, oh my gosh, I, we're planning a Republican debate coming up soon for the governor's uh, six candidates in Illinois. And they are, they're, they're pulling out the people for me to, to lean on, which I need. So it, it's, it, it is, it, it, you know, there, there's always, you know, you always want more. You, you know, you always want to have. I wish I had an intern all the time. I wish I had someone next to me that could help write the web story when I'm doing the broadcast story. You know, I'm sitting there later at night still handing that one in. But um, I, I, I do see in Chicago is a big journalism town, and they care about TV journalism. It is not L.A., where it's you know sort of the stars and the access Hollywood, whatever. So that's my positive spin, but it, it is the truth. I've been really heartened by the rise of nonprofit news outlets like the Texas Tribune, ProPublica, places like that they have, that have done really good, you know, investigative stories uh, and then partnered with local journalism, local newsrooms to have a platform to put them out. So, I mean, I think hopefully the sort of approach to investigative journalism, starting with documents, moving to people, like that is something that can be, can be done on a, you know, long time horizon or a short time horizon and by people anywhere. Um, but I do worry that the business model of local journalism makes it harder for people to do it, even just regular beat reporting, much less long-term projects in a lot of places. Can I mention Block Club Chicago, which you oh, probably so have good. heard of. I mean, they've just been amazing. This startup that is, you know, if you're not following them as well. I mean, they, last year during the whole the pandemic and the uh, distribution of the vaccine, they started with the story of how this little hospital on the west side, which was a safety net hospital, was supposed to be targeting their vaccines only to the people either that worked at the hospital or the neighborhood. Well, it turned out uh, one of the doctors was taking it to the Gold Coast, to a restaurant, to a jewelry store, to, the Trump, to, the, to the Trump, Trump Hotel. Hotel. And, you know, so they have become, you know, and we credit them, obviously, but you see that in Block Club and you go, okay, wait a second, I need to be making some calls on this. Yeah, they're great. Yeah, yeah. Anybody else? Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, Sam Charles, I work in the news here in Chicago. Hey, hey. S super big fan of yours. Thank you. Um, so no doubt you're crazy well-sourced. Um, how do you prioritize which story gets your attention right now? And like what goes on the back burner for a later time? And he does an amazing job. Sam Charles, you all should be reading him as well. Uh, <laughs> it's the truth. That's a, I mean, that was a harder thing with Trump because they were always like, you know, short term things and long term things. Now that I'm on the, on the nonprofit beat, like everything is a little more long term. For me, it's been, I have a really good editor that I sort of go to with a list of stories, and I'm just like, okay, you know, here's what I think I'm going to do, and he'll say, I like that, I don't like that, you know, put this on the back burner. So I think that's been, uh, basically, I find it so hard when I'm on a, on a beat, I'm so close to it that sometimes I have trouble determining, like, what would be surprising to somebody who's not, no, you know, doesn't know as much as I do. Uh, and so then you need somebody like, a, you know, a friend at work or an editor that you can say, like, you know, that you can talk to about your work and have them say, like, oh, that's the story, not this other stuff. You also tend to, I feel like, I tend to prioritize things that were harder for me to get, even if they were not the most important thing. Like, if I had to really sweat and struggle to get this thing, I want to make that the lead, I want to make that the story, and you need somebody to be like, no, it's not that, you know, that was hard to get, but it's not that important. This other thing that was easy to get is the more important thing. So I find that it's hard for me to make that judgment myself, so you need somebody to bounce that stuff off. Hi. Michael Glotzer, I'm faculty in biology here. Um, my question is sort of inspired by this uh, Twitter thread by uh, Steve Schmidt over the last couple of days yeah. about yeah. Yes. Uh, Rick Davis and Oleg Deripaska back in 2008. It seems like the uh, investment of Russia into our political system go is even deeper than we thought. Is that a area you, you tend to you plan to? 
dig into more or? Well, so what? at the post. Explain it to those who don't know. Well, so the, the, the Steve Schmidt was an advisor to the McCain campaign in 2008. I've been a Republican uh, campaign person for a long time. Um, I guess I, I, had, I had seen when he was fighting with other people. I didn't see the part about Oleg Derek Paska, but I guess he's saying that a Russian oligarch was, in, was investing in US politics that far back. I sat next to the person, the people at the Post who did that. Like I, she really had like a, you know, like a stereotypical kind of crazy map on the wall of all the different connections between different people. It's a huge, that, that work was tremendously difficult because there were so many people wh whose you know, relationships with Putin and with the Russian government were on purpose opaque. So I know it's been done a lot by the Post and the Times. It's not something that I've ever done. It may be something that I get, get into in the future, um, but I would always look at that and think like that. It was it's such a frustrating job in many ways because it was so much work to establish just the basic things happen. These people knew these people. These people gave this order. And often she was in the position of writing about somebody who would then become super important six months later. You know, she'd write a story about Konstantin Kalimnik, and everyone would go, who the hell was that? And then like six months later, he'd show up in the Trump impeachment. So she was ahead of her time in a way that did not produce a lot of web traffic at the time she wrote the stories. So those stories are really hard, and I'm glad people do them, but I have not done that much on them so far, at least. Hi, uh, my name's Dave Komenecki. Do you think the Walter Durante Pulitzer should be rescinded? Oh. And would that be a good or a bad precedent? So th this is a fascinating story. So the, the, I just, the Times, uh, in 1933, the New York Times correspondent in Moscow won a Pulitzer for international reporting. Turned out, I mean, this was at a time when there was almost, you know, during, under Stalin, there was very little other news coming out of Russia. Like, you, basically, people, people were really reliant on a small number of foreign journalists, of which this Walter Durrani was the number, you know, the sort of most prominent for any news about Russia. And this guy, Durrani, loved Stalin. Well, everything he wrote was about how great Stalin was. Stalin was the leader that Russia needed at the moment. You couldn't judge Stalin by Western standards. You know, the reports of a famine in Ukraine where, you know, really 10 millions of people died were, over, you know, overblown. Everybody had enough to eat. And so the question, he, the question was, should he have his Pulitzer revoked? I don't want to give my opinion about it because I haven't, I haven't read it enough to really have a, have a valuable opinion. It does seem like something that, I guess the Times' argument is that you know, by, by leaving it on the record, we own it and own the failure and we don't want to whitewash it. We don't want to eliminate it. We want to contextualize and tell people that this was a horrible thing and the things he was writing didn't reflect the truth, but eliminating it disappears it from the record. I don't feel like I don't know enough to offer an opinion either way, but I'm glad people have brought this up and I do feel like there should be some way that if you're a casual observer, you should know when you come to that page in the Pulitzers, maybe you do, I haven't looked at it recently, that the stuff this guy was writing was, wrong, was, was not true. The closest parallel to this, I think, was the Janet Cook story in the, in the Washington Post. Uh, I, think, I forget whether it was the late 80s or the early 90s. A Washington Post Metro reporter wrote that she had discovered, uh, it was, the stories were called Jimmy's World. She discovered a, like an eight-year-old boy who was addicted to heroin, and she right. wrote all this, these stories about, maybe it should have been one story, but she wrote about basically this, this child who was being injected with heroin by his stepfather and you know, he was addicted to drugs. And so the, the city, even in Washington in 1991, which is a very crime-ridden city, this shocked everyone. And the city pulled all the stops out to try to find this kid and you know, get, him, get him some help. And they couldn't. The DC police looked all over the, you know, the city, looked for this, this child and couldn't find him. And then Janet Cook later, uh, as she was being awarded the Pulitzer, I think, the story was that she had claimed in her resume that she spoke French or went to, o she graduated from Oberlin, I think. And, and that was a lie, too. And getting caught in that one little lie, then Ben Bradley, the editor of the Washington Post, brought her into his office and asked her to speak French, and she couldn't. And the whole thing unraveled. And I think the Post gave it back. I don't think the time, I, I, don't, I don't think the Pulitzer, she somehow lost her Pulitzer, but I forget from what end it happened. That's the closest parallel, um, but obviously that happened in the moment. It didn't happen decades later. So I'm glad it's being talked about, although I don't know the right thing to do. All right. Hi, my name is Lily. Um, I work at Progressive Turnout Project doing voter turnout in the South. Um, and I was wondering what you think the nationalization of news, what that, the impact of that is on local and state elections. Oh, I think it's so bad for, for local and state elections. I mean, I'm glad that people read the New York Times, uh, and I'm, you know, we do a lot to try to cover you know, the details of every local election, you know, every cover, cover judges and senator races, but we're never gonna have as much as the local journalists would, and I think you, it, you, it, t it leads to a situation where people vote you know, for local candidates based on whatever their national affiliation is, sometimes without really even knowing who they're voting for. 
Um, that's my problem more broadly with like electing judges and in in you're, you're just casting a vote for a party. You have no idea who the person is you're voting for. Um, so I, I, that's why I think it's so good places like Texas Tribune and other places are rising up to fill that need and write about the individuals rather than just having voters see it as a reflection of the party. I think tonight in Nebraska, there's a primary where one of the Republican primary, one of the governor uh, candidates has been accused of groping people. Like he has some, I think, pretty credible allegations as far as I've read. Um, and you wonder how much people know that. Are they just viewing him through the prism of like, is he, you know, his political affiliation? So I, I wish there was more coverage of those things, and I think it would be better if there was. I just, I think we're running out of time. All right. I, I just wanted to add, take the director's prerogative and ask <laughs> the last question, but. Uh, we had, David, a uh, conference here in early April on disinformation and democracy. One of the keynote speakers was uh, Maria Ressa from the Philippines. Yes. Um, she's currently uh, under multiple indictments, looking at if you, she were convicted of all of them, uh, 100 years in prison. Um, and it struck me that we, we take so much for granted here. And... Uh, do you find yourself ever worrying about what, what if the things that we take for granted change? Uh, what if a different regimen, uh, different president, different courts uh, take hold uh, and you don't have the ability to do what you do without great risk? Yes. You're right that I think we take so much for granted in the U.S. that, you know, that obviously there were journalists who were subjected to, 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 you know, physical assault or to threats of violence under the Trump era, but it's nothing like what Maria Ressa deals with in the Philippines or Russian journalists or, you know, journalists in places all over the world where there's so much bravery involved in just being a journalist and just asking the questions. I do worry about that. I mean, I worried about that in 2016. My experience, you know, there, there were things like uh, using wiretaps on journalists. There were some violations of the traditional boundaries of press freedom under Trump, but it was not, you know, I did my job the same way I had always done it. But I do worry, like I said, that we can't count on the fact that it happened in the past to protect us in the future. So, yes, it's something that I worry about. There's been so many instances we've had recently where things that we thought, you know, could never happen in America or would never happen because it is America happened. Um, and I worry that will be one of the, the things that happens in the future. So, certainly, yes. Absolutely. So that's my way of saying thank you. Oh, thank you. Hey, hey. <laughs> One of my proudest moments was going to a town board meeting and getting kicked out, and I said, I represent the people's right to know. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's absolutely right. <laughs> I just loved that. I thought that was just, you know, like, whoa. David, it was just really terrific thank to you. hear from you in person. All of you that are here tonight, oh my gosh, thank you very much. I think the future of journalism, is, I hope it's good. I think, you know, let's, let's see the glass half full, okay? Ah, very much, thank you all. Thank you all. Thanks very much. <laughs>